Welcome back to On Listening. This is your host, Daniel Rosen. I'm here today with my friend and fellow psychotherapist, Stephen Benjamin from Rochester. Great to be here, Dan. I'm very happy to have you on. As usual, we're going to be talking about listening. And so I wanted Steve on because I have found that as a a friend in the field, he listens really well. And I noticed that Steve listens with his uh, whole self. And as I'm exploring other people's understanding of listening and how they experience it and what they think about it or learn from, learn how to listen, learn from other people about listening, I thought Steve would be a nice guest. I'm sorry, Dan. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. He couldn't, and and as a typical form, he cannot resist the low hanging fruit, the the soft pitch. <laughs> good, good, good. We'll we'll see if that gets by our editor. Okay, so tell us, uh, Steve, what, what what would you like to say about listening? So I guess. Uh, Boy, I'm certainly in the field where that's the primary ingredient. And uh, I was thinking about a few different things in that regard before uh, our meeting today and our chat. Uh, I guess when it comes to listening in my field, there's uh, obviously listening to what's said. Um, There's also listening to what's not being said. Right. Right. There's also listening to the content and uh, listening to the energy or the lack of it or the affect uh, or the feelings uh, around the words that, you know, as we all know, can have as much or more uh, meaning or communicative uh, value as the actual words being said. How do you listen to affect? That's such. Uh, uh, I wasn't prepared for a good question like that. All right, so let me let me pause on that. I I love that question. Uh, how do I listen to affect? So a couple things come to mind. One is that uh, obviously uh, tuning in to the volume and the uh, maybe in a broader term that just the sense of energy. Uh, that's coming towards me. But I think I also listen to affect by noticing what's happening in my body when I'm with somebody so that uh, that can be a cue uh, that alerts me to something that um, that might be pertinent about what's happening in the room at that moment. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, to add to that, uh, whatever is happening inside of me uh, might be a function of just some emotional material in me that's really not pertinent to what I'm hearing, or it might be a, a valuable radar to guide me as to uh, uh, what to focus on uh, uh, and how to focus on it. Yeah, I, I, I like that you uh, brought in the second part. I think some of the other guests... I've had are going to talk about the what arises in me in response to what you have talked about. But the first part, you you know, how do you listen to affect? It is sort of a trick question because affect doesn't really make a sound. You're so we can make some suppositions. I think about somebody's affect, their mood. Mm -hmm. Sometimes their affect and their mood don't really match. They're in a really terrible mood, but they're really perky and acting really happy. Um, And then how do we differentiate? You know. person's uh, overjoyed uh, the day after their child got into college, but there's something inside us that's arising that doesn't feel congruent with that. And uh, we ask about that and we find out that that person's actually heartbroken, that their child is going to be leaving them for four years, um, even though they're happy. So that uh, what happens inside us is so essential in listening that we're the more we can listen to ourselves the more we can listen to others yes 
So right there, uh, one of the things that comes up for me is uh, I, I love that example. And I, I think there's a an, an error that's often made uh, when maybe somebody is presenting happiness at their child uh, getting into college and moving on. Uh, and then as we um, explore with them, uh, all of a sudden you might see... Uh, um, a wellspring bust loose of, of sadness. And the, the error that I'm referring to is that sometimes uh, I, I've noticed this uh, just in a lot of uh, comments uh, that I've heard people make both in my practice and, the, and in the world that uh, one feeling was the um, superficial one and then the one that came in stronger and underneath later was the real one. And, and I really take issue with that. I think they're, they're both valid. Uh, but I, I, it's a dynamic I hear a lot, that one is the real and the other is not. And I, I think there's a complexity to humans that allows for, for both feelings to be real. Right. It would be a digression we're not going to get into, but we also hear that a lot about alcohol and drugs. Like people are, you know, the people are their they're real selves when they're intoxicated or something like that. I think sort of truth serum uh, oh, right. perpetuates that kind of myth. Um, but yes, I think that people are complex and they have multiple things going on. Well, I know you're a student of internal family systems uh, psychotherapy, which is a model where the different parts of us and how each part has its own part to play is really emphasized. And in particular in a language, you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners are not psychotherapists. Internal family systems, for me and maybe for other people, is sort of the most accessible way to think about the different parts of us and what arises you know, so that there's a part of a parent who's very happy about their child going off, and there's another part that's very sad. And and um, maybe you could say something about that. I know you've studied IFS. But. Yes, I am. Um, uh, that's. I think IFS is a great model. I I do lean into it periodically, um, and. You know, I guess an overarching kind of view that I have of internal family systems is that there are parts within us that seem to serve as um, protectors or, or serve some kind of protective function and other parts in us that are being protected. So as an example, well, well, jumping off the example you gave, uh, the parent uh, that's uh, seen their child launch uh, the part that's kind of having a um, a strong grasp of the happiness aspect of that um, might be viewed as a protector for the part underneath that's feeling pain. Yes, right. I think that was sort of what was in my head a little bit around that uh, example, and it, and then and then that's I think what people that that's where the error comes in, like as if the protector doesn't matter. You know, I, IFS is huge strength is, wait a minute, these protectors are super important. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm reminded actually, uh, uh, I'm not good with time, but a period of time ago, I, I, I was meeting with somebody that uh, uh, she had dated a man for a, a couple months and then he ended the relationship and she was really upset and very tearful, and there was a lot of uh, self-attack going on. Uh, I'm not good enough, that kind of language. And You've just described about five million people <laughs> in America right now, but go on. <laughs> so, uh, but what I remember about that conversation is... At one point, uh, because I, I made the decision to just stay with her pain and not immediately counter the self-attack, but I, just that feeling. Some people, you just know they need time to, to really feel heard. So I was in that kind of rhythm with her. And then kind of randomly, she says something like, I don't understand the evolutionary purpose of crying. 
I hate crying. And I understand fight or flight. That helped us survive. But what on earth does crying have to do? What, what possible utility does it have? And, you know, one could have taken the view like, okay, she's getting intellectual and that's a protector. But I also noticed an uptick in her affect uh, in terms of more energy and a little more, um, well, less self-attack, certainly. Um, and, uh, so I just stayed with that. I stayed with that channel and we explored what, and she talked about how she even went online and explored that about why, what's the purpose of people crying. And in the context of us exploring that, she, uh, she just seemed to bump into her own resources. All of a sudden she started making some jokes and then she started sounding so much more resourceful around this breakup. Well, I think you've just, to, to, to get a really good example of listening to affect in the way you, the first meaning of listening to affect, you were really tracking this person's mood. And there's a temptation to always go for the gut punch in psychotherapy, to go for the, you know, to stay away from the intellectualization, stay away from the, uh, the, the thinking and go for the affect. And I think that one of the things I like about the way you listen is you were able to turn on a dime, you were able to turn very quickly and just whatever whatever was happening moment to moment, that's the, you know, the watchword in mindfulness, notice moment to moment. And you listened moment to moment and it was moving quickly and maybe unexpectedly and you stayed with it and it proved really useful. So the listening um, in sort of very small chunks and then that listening to affect. Um, I also like that you gave space, you know, the allowed whatever was going to happen next happen with that person. So it sounds like a marvelous example of uh, uh, effective counseling, um, but really guided by the listening. Right. And I, uh, I think it's probably, uh, you know, one of the maybe dirty little secrets in our field is that as therapists, we feel uh, frequently compelled, like I've got to do something. Oh God! I've got to make something happen. Uh, and the, 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 you know, the when in our quieter, saner moments, I think we're all more clear on the fact that people come in with all kinds of resources, and when you're really, really present with them, sometimes they just uh, bubble right up. And then all your job is simplified and you just to get to highlight what you're witnessing uh, so that they don't miss it either, that they're resourcing themselves. And uh, in, even in the midst of what feels like tragedy, uh, that's an interesting phenomenon and it, bringing curiosity to that uh, doesn't require us as therapists to do some technique. It yeah, just... Uh, yeah. Or allows uh, resourcing to occur in its own way. Sometimes, just a minor, just a one or two senses. How how would you describe resources? Resourcing. Um. So I I guess my thought on that is that resourcing can take many forms. It can take uh, the form of accessing. Uh, a sense of groundedness or physical uh, um, softening uh, in a system that's otherwise on maybe some level of threat response. That might be form a form of resourcing. Another form of resourcing might be uh, beginning to entertain, just on a cognitive level alone, a perspective that allows for uh, um, possibility and uh, and even healthy skepticism of n negative trains of thought. Yeah, I was thinking a little more concretely um, <clears throat> uh, around some like a positive affirmation is a is a resource, or remember, you know, uh, remembering what a, an old mentor or, or a, a parent who was helpful to you might say. You know, what would you, to think about what someone might say to you, or how they would stick with you to conjure up the imagery and experience of being understood, or um, a time when you felt really, if when a person's crying, for example, a time when you felt really strong and secure as 
these are also sort of resources, but I, mm -hmm. I think I leaned into it and wanted to define it because it's uh, it's connected to listening. We can, you know, we can listen to stronger parts of ourself and help bolster ourselves up because those research, the idea of resources is they're already tucked inside us. We just might not be paying attention to them at the time. Yeah. I, uh, I'm reminded of, I actually had a client a few years ago uh, tell me about uh, this book he was reading on neuroscience. And he was highlighting that when human beings practice affirmations in a, like a declarative sentence form. Uh, like that, I am. I am. Right. I am confident or I can do this. Uh, that there is a, um, there's a, uh, that it it really activates a certain part of the brain. But when a human um, being is asked a question, even if we ask a question of ourselves, it activates a very, very different part of the brain. And that there's, uh, the, again, I'm paraphrasing what he was saying to me, that there's evidence that, um, that our brains love questions more than declarative statements. And that a really, really good question can activate resourcing in a way that a suggestion doesn't. So what would be uh, an example of a question that would activate resourcing? Um, yeah, even just to concretize it, uh, the difference between, uh, uh, tell me about a time when uh, you felt really heard versus uh, well, what was a time in your life when you felt really hurt? Um, that there's a there's a difference in a. Um, let's give let's give that uh, uh, again to our audience. So, uh, I'll say the first one. Tell me about a time in your life where you felt very strong. Versus and sort of notice so notice what that feels like. What part of your self is activated? And when Steve says it, asks as it as a as a question, what comes up? The question. Uh, Can you tell me about a time? Right. So the question is, uh, what what would be a time when you uh, noticed feeling really strong in your life? Yeah. Even as you and I are talking now, I'm kind of noticing that there's a. You know that a statement versus a question. There might be actually times when a statement is better than a question. Well, of course, of course, yeah. But I, but did, but this, uh, I felt it. So I felt a slightly different feeling inside m my head when you phrased it as uh, a question. Yeah, the first time, but it was very quick. So I wanted to lean into it again and see what that felt like. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's. Um, I like that. That's one of those things I'm going to try to remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we're going to go back in time a teeny bit. You uh, absolutely intrigued me with the introduction around listening. You said uh, a big part of listening is listening to what people are not saying. Yes. So, okay, what might I say about that? Um So let's say uh, somebody tells me a story that they got yelled at by their boss. And I ask them, well, when your boss spoke to you in that way, uh, that was, say it was very demeaning, um, how did you feel towards your boss? And uh, I might get a response like, oh, I felt my stomach drop and I was just like, uh, 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 overwhelmed and I felt like a worthless piece of shit. And uh, can I use profanity here? I don't know. We have a rule on that. I just, uh, well. You're good with it. Yeah. Yeah. There's always an, an editor maybe. Huh? <laughs> anyway. Um, but, you know, uh, what occurs in my head when I hear that response is that the person did not answer the question. They're telling me how they felt on the inside but they're not telling me, how did you feel towards your boss? Right. So that would be an example of, some, of what somebody's not saying that I think can be a useful tracking 
uh, mechanism for us. And to, at some point, based on that whole notion of pacing or, or, or leading uh, in our role, uh, could be something worth returning to or maybe even immediately returning to. Certainly, if you uh, ask them how they feel towards their boss and they didn't answer it, you're going to want to come back to that right away. Yeah. Um, I, I was remembering some people I've known in my life that the, lo- the longer I knew them, you sort of I sort of got more cued in to what they didn't say. Like that was almost a, a deeper window into what's going on for them than what they did say. And uh, yeah. I, for example, if there's a, to again, concretize it, let's say that person's child was struggling with something and uh, we're having lunch together and we talk about how well their career is going and uh, how much they love their partner and um, uh, they ask about me. By the end of the conversation, I'm going to notice that they're not saying anything about their child and and that becomes significant in that regard. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. And I, I think it speaks to why uh, a, a good reason why people get something out of therapy. That's an opportunity that they get to maybe discover something that they're maybe semi aware of, or even even more unconscious of. But when it's when the implicit is made more explicit, then we have choice when we would not have a choice otherwise. So. Uh Wonderful stuff so far. I really appreciate having you on and listening to this. I know that uh, part of, for you, part of listening is uh, getting feedback from people. You want to, you you know, I mean, obviously listening is a two-way street and I'm focusing more on the listening part and less on what we say, you know, a, a more complete podcast or a different, a different podcast would be on human communication, but I'm really focusing on the listening part. And of course you can't, talk about that in a complete vacuum so there is some uh, responsiveness that prompts better listening or that comes from listening well but uh, maybe you have something to say about the concept of feedback yeah that's I um, I'm reminded of the work of uh, Scott Miller I'm a fan a lot of what he does Um, and I I think what stands out for me personally when I work with people is that when I purposefully devote the last five or 10 minutes of a session to having a conversation about what this session we had was like, and specifically uh, requesting, and sometimes, frankly, being a bit of a pest around getting negative feedback uh, around uh, what just happened in this hour between us, that has periodically been like a gold mine. And it just has really generated in me more and more uh, respect for that dynamic. Uh, you re- you really turned me on to uh, Scott Miller's work of uh, feedback-informed treatment. Uh, um, trainings are coming out of the International Center for Clinical Excellence. Right. And uh, I intermittently use... Uh, that model and, but definitely get more feedback since learning that, trying to get more feedback from clients. Mm -hmm. How is a conversation going? And I'm supervising some clinicians too. So how is this going for you? It's such a wonderful, um, yeah, it's such a wonderful tool. Yeah. And it's really opened my eyes. I mean, uh, there are times when I would have a session with somebody, and in my head, I would think, oh, that, w- that was a pretty good session. And you know, frankly, most of the time I'm right. But yeah. periodically, I'm just wrong. Uh, I, all of a sudden, I'm recognizing that uh, I, this person did not get some, what they were looking for. And so taking the time to review the session before they walk out the door can be really pivotal as a reset so that we uh, can hopefully get uh, back on the same team, going in the same direction, uh, that kind of thing. So feedback is, yeah, it's really interesting to me. It's hard to, it's hard to convince people that you're interested in listening to constructive feedback. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, you know, that's a really good point. And I think because therapy has a power differential, I mean, it just does. The therapist uh, has uh, the, the, the trappings of an authority uh, position. And, uh, you know, for good reason, we're devoting our lives to wanting to bring something with, of our expertise uh, and hopefully help, help people move from point A to, to point B in a meaningful way. Um, but there's uh, a lot to be said when it's uh, more collaborative. And one of the things I found useful in convincing people that I'm really interested in feedback is they'll give them like a menu of uh, possibilities of some of the <laughs> things I've heard in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Which include, uh, uh, you know, Steve, you were focusing here and I really feel like uh, you're, you're not focusing on the thing I want to focus on or I, I really want you to uh, talk more or I want you to talk less uh, or uh, I, I want you to uh, challenge me more or, yeah, I, right. or your click, your, your clock ticks too loud. I don't like it. You know, I mean, uh, the range is really, yeah. really interesting. And when I outline to people some things that I've heard and how useful it's been, sometimes it can be helpful then in, in really convincing and opening that door. I have uh, struggled with uh, how much do I pester people to give me constructive feedback. And I think I've, Maybe a little proud of this way of thinking about it. I don't know. Uh, put myself out there saying that, especially because I have a fantasy that I'm going to, that Scott Miller will come on the Listen podcast and talk about listening to listening to client feedback and listening to data um, as opposed to subjective experience. Because uh, us therapists, we tend to all think that we're uh, uh, more accomplished and successful than the data might show we are. But <clears throat> the one of the things that... Uh, yeah, can I uh, just add one thing to that? Sure. Yeah, because uh, I, I think you're highlighting really something important. The, the, the data that I'm familiar with does highlight that therapists tend to think they're better at uh, the kind of outcomes they achieve than they actually achieve. Uh, at the same time, the data in the field of psychotherapy as a whole is really encouraging. Yes, it's right. We're, we're, uh, as a field, we are absolutely effective. Yeah. And some are better than others. Yes, and it's trainable. So the 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 way I've been talking about getting feedback is that um, imagine you're you want to go to the Olympics and you're uh, you're whatever sport it is you're you want to be a runner and you're going to go to the Olympics and you have a coach and if every time you met with your coach, your coach said, that was great. Man, I'd never seen you run that well before. That was just perfect. Everything was wonderful. Um, you're probably not going to get much better. Your coach is going to have to say, yeah, that was great, but you have to stop leaning to the left and you're breathing in the wrong way and you clearly didn't warm up today and all yes. kinds of things about coaching right. that I have no idea. <clears throat> and uh, – the athlete's going to have to say to the coach, uh, look, you can't, you can only give me one thing at a time or I got to block it all out. Yes. Or um, I, you have to help me access the depths of myself that I don't know I have. So uh, you look at the outcome. Does the person want run better when the coach is harder or when the coach is softer? And we would, we would never expect that uh, uh, there wouldn't be some feedback about how the person's doing um, but somehow in uh, counseling and other meta and other health oriented relationships, there's this idea that uh, somebody knows better. Right. It's destructive thinking, I think. Yeah. And it's also complex, even as I hear you say that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a notion in our field of, oh, this uh, psychotherapist should never give advice. Some people want advice. Oh, I had a exactly. I had a, I had a supervisor once, a consultant, and he said, "What what what are people paying you for if if not new ideas?" Yeah, which is similar to advice, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 that's right. So your advice to therapists is to give advice. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> except that. when you don't. Except yeah. when you don't. <laughs> so okay, to sh shift a little bit, shift the energy just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what, I've been thinking about 
listen. So listening, <clears throat> listening is pretty much universally good. We we listen and we tend to uh, not appreciate people who aren't good listeners or not feeling listened to. And usually there's something not so great going on when we're not listening, uh, certainly not paying attention to who we're listening to. There might be good reasons for that. But overall, like in the when I think about the world of uh, what do we want more of in the world versus what do we want less of, pretty much universally, I think that we want more listening. And uh, here's an, an analogy. So I think that people think about empathy or I have thought about empathy in the same way. What The world would simply be a better place if there was more empathy. Why can't, you know, it's a little like, why can't we all get along? Why can't we understand why other people are in pain? And uh, whether you actually feel their pain or your super understanding of why they're feeling pain and can simulate it a little bit in your own mind, the general idea that we should be more empathic. And I read this uh uh, research that suggests that there's a dark side to empathy. I don't oh, know Paul Bloom's work? Is it Paul Bloom? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same. Uh, he wrote a book called Against Empathy. Oh, well, that's pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to bring him on the show. Uh, and uh, you tell me if it's the same stuff. That So what, what makes your neighbor uh, join a terrorist organization? Uh, why, why, would it, why, you know, why would someone join a group that is dedicated to the destruction of another group? And uh, the research that I said posits that it's empathy. Why would you join a, an organization that's harmful, that's causing harm or destructive? Because you empathize with the plight of the people who are part of that. I'll call them terrorist groups. But right. Uh -huh. From their perspective, they wouldn't be terrorist groups. They'd be liberators or rebels. Right. right. And that uh, that's a clearly a dark side of empathy. So to analogize, I've been wondering, is there a dark side to listening? And yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a great channel to explore. In the work that I do, I would cite the notion that encouraging people to talk and for me to listen to them give voice to things that, uh, as they begin to speak of them, they're getting overwhelmed. Then there's no there's no value in in me listening intently when their system is uh, beyond any capacity to use it in any kind of useful way or process it. And so I think that would be an example of uh, when a therapist, uh, again, that's my reference point, a therapist just adopting a, a listening posture in relationship to somebody being overwhelmed as they talk about, uh, say, some trauma. Uh, is would be feeding a dark side of listening, frankly. That there needs to be, uh, for, for the welfare of the person that's suffering, an interruption and a pause and a time to recognize that um, there's a way that uh, this can be approached, but to respect pacing and titration and uh, to let a person know that, that that's a, a real viable option. Uh, I'm also, you know, as you were talking, I, I had another kind of a, a more personal example pop into my head. I remember uh, years ago when I was in my 20s, I had this uh, older relative that was, he was just kind of a nonstop talker. And whenever I would encounter him at family gatherings, uh, I would like inside, I'd be like, oh God, here he comes. And, and it you know, when we would talk, he would just go on and on and on and on. And I'm, you know, of course, I'm a professional listener. Right. <laughs> so I, that's my default. But I, I found that I needed to shift gears. And so when, when there was a slight pause and I would start to maybe tell a story uh, that was maybe a little bit reflective of what he had just said, and maybe uh, 10 words into it, he would just start to bowl me over like, oh yeah, and you know, that reminds me. And he would start to, he would start yeah. to try to take it right. over again. And I started to learn to just go, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. And honest to God, I had to say it maybe like 12 times. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, oh, 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 oh you're not done yet. So there, I, I think there was something empowering about not listening. 
about what, what's the example of not listening that's empowering in there? Uh, so in other words, uh, if I had just gone into my default mode and listened to his uh, ongoing monologue and then later somehow found a way to extricate myself from that conversation, then I'm disempowering myself. Yes, 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 right, right. But when I take a position of, okay, here's when listening, here's the dark side of listening. Yeah, I'm not this, interested in listening anymore. This is uh, not... Uh, it's not good for me, but frankly, I don't even think it's, it's good for him. I, I right. think uh, getting some uh, honest feedback, even in the form of, right. hang on, hang on, I'm not done, is a, a useful reality check for him. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, had, I had never, uh, I mean, just hearing you talk about it, was those things were popping in my head a little. Yeah, here's my association to that is you talked about the power differential with clients and therapists. And it's sort of my nightmare scenario. I'm sure it's happened, but I don't want to think about it, that I've been uh, waxing poetic <laughs> or on a, uh, down a, 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 you know, a, I think I'm on to something with a client, a uh, series of, that would be like a series of questions uh -huh. along a certain line. And uh, I think, I'm sure you share the same fear that our client would compliantly respond when they don't want to be listening. They're not interested in our advice, perhaps, or they're not interested in those questions. So I guess if there's a gift for the people in the therapy chair, it's uh, it, it, it's really on. It's okay to tell the therapist I'm not interested in that. They might explore the resistance, but sometimes is listening to the feedback that this is not what's good for me right now. Or, yes. Yeah. And uh, as a patient, as a client uh, in therapy, it, it's really hard to do, even though cognitively I know that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> right. If we feel like we have a really good idea or something useful, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. Good. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me and our audience. And uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you and listening. Likewise, Dan. And we opened the door here to the dark side of listening, and I liked, I liked what you had to say about that. I think it's uh, – I'm, I'm sure it's there, you know. Yeah. I'm sure it's there, and I, I, you, I think you gave some good examples of uh, – how listening isn't always the appropriate strategy in a particular moment. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I love that you bring it up, frankly, Dan. It's, it's the way I experience you all the time. You always look for uh, things that other people don't think about. And so I, I, I've always liked that about the way you and I talk. Vice versa. And that concludes another episode of On Listening. Again, I encourage you to visit our website, onlistening.net. And subscribe to the show, send an email with a question, recommend a guest, recommend a topic, ask me a question. Be happy to respond. As always, or at least for now, on listening is without commercials. I hope to continue it that way, simply for the joy of recording this. Thank you. <laughs>